1976, of all the things that happened, <laughs> was that this book was published. So George Tremlett's um, biography of 10cc. And it was instantly invalidated. And I just want to read you, you didn't know you were coming to a book reading, but I'm going to give you one anyway. <laughs> so just a quote from Lol Cream here, where he says, there's nothing really that could be so great that we couldn't sort out the problems. And as the book came out, of course, the band split in half. So the book was instantly invalidated. Good for the kind of early history, but everything beyond that, the kind of good morning judge, things we do for love, consequences, all the 10cc and godly and cream stuff was lost. And um, so for, for fans of 10cc, this book was of interest, but didn't tell the full story. And it wasn't until 1990... 2000. 2000. You wrote it in the 90s, though, didn't you? <laughs> it wasn't until 2000 that Liam gave 10cc fans what they were after, a book on 10cc. But obviously in the last 20 years, so much has happened and kind of 10cc's place in history has been re-evaluated. Um, we've done various bits of Strawberry Studio stuff. What perfect timing to have. <laughs> Come on, so um, this is Liam. Thanks for coming. So I've just got onto yeah, Strawberry yeah. Studio. So this is Peter Tattersall who started Strawberry. So Peter's hanging around after Liam's spoken. So when Liam signed his book, if you want a word with Peter, I'm sure he'll be only too happy. But obviously everything that happened at Strawberry is thanks to Peter. So go and grab yourself a seat, Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> What's so in the last 20 years 10 cc's place in history re-evaluated and um, I think it was timely that Liam decided that he was going to update and republish his book so What's going to happen is I'm going to hand over to Liam, who's going to spend about 20 minutes telling you about the journey to writing the book. Then we're going to throw open the floor for Q and A's. If you've got any questions you want to ask Liam, then feel free. And then obviously we're going to finish with Liam signing copies of the book. If you've already brought your own copy, fantastic. If you haven't and you want to buy one, they are on sale upstairs in the museum reception. And if you quickly nip up and buy one and run back down, Liam will sign it for you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the man who's brought 10cc back to life <laughs> and encapsulated their history. But ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to 10cc author Liam Newton. Thank you everyone. Well, I've, the first thing I want to do is thank um, Peter and the Stockport Museum for hosting the, the book launch um, here. Peter was a big help when I wrote the book first time round back at the end of the sort of 90s and has been a big help uh, with the new edition because um, he's one of the leading authorities on, on, on Strawberry. It's fantastic to have, to have uh, Peter here, one of the, the founder of Strawberry Studios. It's a, it's a real coup to have you here, Peter. Thank you for that. Little bit yeah, well, it's even so. It's great. Um, you know, Peter knows more about me than yeah. I know myself. Amazing. Don't So, what? So, the plan is to is to give a little bit of a twenty minutes talk, a little bit around, I guess, why I wrote the book in the first place, and a little bit of you know maybe some of the encounters um, on the way. I'll try and keep it to, to twenty minutes. Then we'll open the floor up for Q&A, um, do some signings, and then I think, where's the pub afterwards, Peter, the Brewer's Arms, something like that? So if anyone fancies a, a drink afterwards, we can, we can kind of go and do that. Um, I, came, I came up here um, two years ago to see the Strawberry I'm In Love exhibit. Did anyone else come and, and see that? You know, ma really amazing um, piece of work that Peter curated, and um, I spent the day up here and just you know, looking, at, looking at the exhibits. This isn't my photo, this is, this is a, a famous photo by Kevin Cummins, but on the way back um, from the exhibit to the station, I kind of stood pretty much in that exact same spot uh, and looked wistfully down at that, that building. Um, and, and it just, again, blew my mind, even though, you know, I, I know it, but uh, all of this amazing music that um, I've enjoyed since the age of nine, you know, all these incredible songs went through my head as I kind of looked down at that building. 
just what an incredible um, place, not just clearly for, for 10cc, but all the, the stuff that came out of Strawberry Studios before, before and after. So when it came to the book launch, um, it felt appropriate to do it here as the, in the sort of spiritual home of, of 10cc in, in Stockport. So thank you very much for taking the time to sort of come along and, uh, and be here for the launch. Come in, that's fine, no, don't worry. So I think it says, it says on the back cover of the book that um, I'm, uh, I'm not in love with 10cc and, and I think probably haven't, haven't been, or it's a silly phase I've been going through since the age of about nine. <coughs> That's about right. I mean, I, when I was nine, a friend of mine, Paul Williams at primary school, we used to go back to his house after school. His dad was a, a massive 10cc fan and his dad had this amazing stereo for the time that we never had at home. We had a, a plonky kind of record player, but his dad had this really amazing system. And he had, I think, original, uh, original soundtrack and How Dare You. And we used to sort of take it in terms of listening to those albums on, you know, with headphones on. And as a nine-year-old boy, I kind of, it really blew my mind listening to that, that music. Um, so much so that even though I probably should have been into punk rock and other things that were kind of starting to emerge at that time, punk rock always seemed really dull compared with the music of 10CC. There was so much invention, every song was different, you know, the musical ideas, the production ideas, particularly when you listen to, you know, listen to it with, uh, with headphones, that um, I became hooked, basically, and since the age of nine, I've kind of been an avowed uh, 10cc fanatic. There was a period in the 80s, maybe, where it was very unfashionable to be a 10cc fan when I went off to university, and it was hard to, to find anybody that I could talk to about 10cc, so I got into some other bands, and then when they reformed in the early 90s, um, I've hoped that they would then become recognised for the band they are, because my the reason for writing the book was that I felt they were the unsung heroes of British music. When you look at what they did before, during and after 10CC, but the story wasn't really well, well known. I thought, like a lot of bands, when they make their comeback, that they then get a bit of recognition, you get the Brit Awards and all those kind of things, and that would happen. Sadly, it didn't happen. Um, and so what I started to do at that point was um, think, well, no one else has written a book about 10CC, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do it. But I'm not an author. It's the only book that I uh, have written and will ever write. And I didn't know how to go about doing it because um, I don't know, I don't operate within that world. So I thought, well, no one, no one will take this seriously unless I sort of create a first draft that kind of shows how serious I am about it. And what I, what I dug out here, I managed to find this last night, was this is from the 7th of January, 1997. I bought up hundreds of copies of Melody Maker and New Musical Express and all those kind of things to try to understand what they were saying and what they were feeling at the time that they made all the records. And I had a go at, at writing my uh, first version of the book, if you like, before getting any of them involved. Um, and there was a chap at the time called Phil Loftus who was heading up the, the fan club at the time. He found a way of, we printed off I think five of these to the guys, to, to the four main guys and, and Harvey Lisberg. And there was like a covering sort of letter, a pleading letter really to kind of say to them, look, I'd, I'd love to interview you to, um, to get your input into this. And, th and this would say was sent out, I remember sending them all off on the 7th of January, 1997. And the response was definitely quiet. There was no response. <laughs> no one gave a shit about it. Um, you know, you kind of, I, and I probably put about four years work to getting it to this point because I started writing at the end of 93, maybe three years to get it to this point. Slowly, um, I managed to get um, uh, interviews with people like Paul Burgess, obviously the drummer in the, in the, the original sort of touring band, um, Zeb White, um, who had some fantastic stories of life uh, on the road, Harvey Lisberg, um, I think even Peter back in the back in the time we, we we spoke about it, and then one eventually Graham agreed to uh, to be interviewed. I remember very nervously meeting up with him in, in the studio in, in in London, spending a couple of hours with him. Such a nice nice guy, but you know this is this, one of the guys that's written all these amazing iconic iconic songs. Um, so I saw him, and then it was a bit like a bus coming along. That uh, once Graham was involved, there was a bit more interest from the others. So I had an amazing weekend where I think I saw, I met up with Eric Stewart on the Friday and uh, Kevin Godley on the Monday. Um, and particularly th this, this version here is Eric's version. So he's a bit, he was ret reticent to get involved, but once he did, um, if, if anyone wants to look at this kind of later, he literally went through it page by page. 
um, with his annotation and his notes of what was right and wrong with it. And I, um, I spent eight hours with Eric in his home studio um, at the time. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Zeb White. Oh, Come on, Zeb White. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to just uh, just nip over slightly, but, but um, that was probably one of the, the highlights. Probably not just writing the book, the writing of probably of my life. You know, you're sitting there in um, in Eric's home studio, and he's talking about these songs that um, he's written, and he's going, "Oh, and I wrote this one." He picks he picks his guitar up and then starts sort of showing you how he you know a riff that he'd come up with. So anyway, I saw him, and then and then Kevin got involved. Um, Lol was the only one, I think he was based in Los Angeles at the time, he, you know, for some reason didn't want to get, get involved. Um, but the book eventually uh, came out um, uh, in the early part of 2000, so I think some people have even got their original sort of copies here, the original version of uh, The Worst Band in the World came out then. And that was pretty much it, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was out there, it was, it was job done. And, um, and then I, I started to get emails from people who couldn't get hold of a copy of the book because I think the publisher went bust uh, shortly afterwards. No, no real connection with the book, hopefully, but they um, weren't around. So people were trying to get a copy of the book. And I remember seeing a little quote from someone saying that the cost of a book, of trying to get hold of this book, is the cost of a, the price of a small sofa, I think it said, was, the, was this kind of quote online. And eventually I sort of saw, this is actually something from um, Amazon last week, you know, this is the this is the price of so I better sell this one actually because this is uh, <laughs> five hundred quid's worth. But I mean it's cra crazy stuff in terms of those those things there. And um, I had a period of time in about 2014, 15 where I had some time and I thought well maybe I should start to do an updated version of the the book. And originally I thought it would be a quick exercise. It was mainly take the existing book and then and then update it. Um, but the more I got into it, actually, the more there were a lot, quite a lot of the book I wanted to rewrite. There was more depth I wanted to go into in the pre-10CC era. There was lots more stuff to cover off in the, in the sort of post-10CC era. And it morphed into something. I, 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 when I picked up my copy, if anyone got one here, just uh, to hand, you just lift it up, anyone's got one in there. I mean, it became a doorstop um, when you look at it compared with, with this here. But I just couldn't, I couldn't help myself. Um, because I still had this juvenile excitement when I found out some small fact that I didn't know before. Pathetic though it is, I got so excited about that and then you'd start to weave it into the, uh, into the book. And, the, and there's a few little things that have come up since publishing the book, so I'm, I've missed those out, but maybe for version, version three of the book, we'll, we'll include those in. Um, so what I did was recontact the, the, the guys. So this is a picture of, of when I met up with Graham again, a uh, second time around in his house with a nice bloody tourists um, sort of poster in the background and uh, we spent a bit of time you know going through um, the background and uh, what's what he'd been doing in the intervening years which was which was fantastic um, I spent a not a particularly good picture of Kevin by the way but it's a it's the start of a video that he did for me I met up with Kevin in Dublin we spent about three hours again updating uh, me on what he'd been doing and as you probably all know Kevin's got a very rich sort of working life that's still very active in terms of what he's doing whether it's video direction directing films you know, all sorts of different things and he agreed to write the foreword to the new book um, everything I asked him to help with I said to him it'd be really helpful if you could do a little video um, just because he'd read the book and he was very complimentary when I sent him a PDF of the book and within about two days this video had come through you know and it's just like you know people say don't meet your heroes but actually I think the great thing about 10cc is that actually they are great guys you know, one and all, and there's less, much less of the ego perhaps than you see in a lot of, lot of bands. So I saw, I saw Kevin. Um, I met up with Jonathan King, uh, which was an interesting experience. Um, and if you, can, if you can put that to one side for a second, um, which is difficult to do, um, the, the stuff that he gave, or the stuff that he, he was talking about in the early years of the band was really interesting because there was loads of stuff in there that I, I didn't know about. You know, I didn't know, for example, you, if you'll read it, you know, people, people will be aware of the song 4% of something, which was their, one of their early B-sides, because that was the deal they had, they only got 4% royalty. Um, what I didn't realise was when he, nego when he got this, did this incredible negotiation with Phonogram, not only did he get a load of, a ch chunk of cash with that um, uh, for, the, for breaking the contract, but he also negotiated a 4% royalty that he got on all future 10 cc recordings. So, original soundtrack becomes a big hit. I'm not in love. Goes 
goes crazy. Jonathan King's making 4% on all of that and has done ever since. You know, so, yeah, exactly. But there was lots of stuff in there that was, that was um, really interesting. And I also met up with um, Aubrey Powell, who was part of the hypnosis uh, team. And um, that was very interesting, just hearing a little bit more about the album covers, because as a 10CC fan, I think the hypnosis covers that went with those albums at the time were an integral part of the whole experience of those kind of albums. And he sort of said to me one day, he said, I've got, I've got a drawer full of you know, photos that have never been seen before. And I kind of kept trying to say, well, can it be great to, to share some of these in the, uh, in the book? This is one, for example, that you'll see from, um, from the sheet music uh, shoot. Um, one of the little things that's interesting here is this was the original, going to be the original colour of the, um, the actual sheet wrapping that went around it. But Storm Thorgus and his partner thought it would be better in a kind of yellow colour. So it's very hand tinted and very colourful, which, which, which actually Aubrey Powell really hated. But that's just one that we've got in the book as an example of that. What I've done is I've just done a little crude mock up here of what it might have looked like if, um, if that picture had been the one that, that made, the, um, made the cover in the end. The other one was interesting was um, for the original soundtrack album. Um, they, they originally tried to, to create that album cover with a photograph. So in the basement of the studio, they set up all, the, all this kind of, all this film equipment. Um, and they took that picture to be used for the album cover. But they kind of felt it was lacking a bit of, you know, warmth, a bit of the sort of the glamour of Hollywood. So they then got Humphrey Ocean to redraw it as the cover we all know. But again, that's what it would have looked like. If, if they kind of stuck maybe with the, uh, with the original one. So the new one is, uh, you know, is much, much better than that. So that was a great experience to sort of see as part, to, to meet up with, um, with him. Um, another one here was you know, an, a previously unseen photo shoot from the, the center of the, uh, the How Dare You album. If you're a real fanatic, you'll be able to see the slightly different expressions and, and things on there. So that was just an interesting one to also um, to include in the book. And and also some stuff from Mark II of the 10CC uh, group. Now, this is a subject that divides fans um, about what, you know, we all, we all are agreed that the, the great years are the, the, the years when the four of them were together. Um, what I wanted to do in the book actually was also just say, look, in the early years of Mark II, Deceptive Bends, Bit of Bloody Tourists, actually there's some work within that, that also needs to be maybe reconsidered rather than it all ending at, at 1976. I know not everybody agrees with that hypothesis. I'm looking at Sean at the back for listening to his, uh, his podcast. <laughs> but um, so there's some nice stuff that, that came, came from that. And this was a, um, this was a more recent one. So um, uh, this is a portrait of, of Eric that was taken in November by his son, uh, Jody, because we just wanted also to have in the book a few more recent uh, pictures. Um, and it's literally again just uh, mentioning to Jilly Hewer, who is his kind of PA. I said it'd be great to have a picture of Eric, and literally within about 48 hours, a picture taken by his son sort of came through. So it's just really nice to get something that's up to date within the uh, within the book book as well. So that's that's a recent one of um, of Eric. Um, hello. Hello. I'm sorry. I've no, don't worry. The wrong that's way. okay. No worries. <laughs> There's a few pictures that we couldn't include in the book. Um, I was really keen to include this picture. Um, this, I think this is the last picture that was taken of the original four of them all together. This was taken on September the 7th, uh, 1976 at the um, Paul McCartney, Buddy Holly lunch that they had together. Um, this was after they played at Nebworth at the end of August. They had started to play or try to record People in Love. It hadn't really worked out as a session. They, they kind of went back to Strawberry after this lunch, listened to People in Love, and then within a few weeks the band had split. So I thought this was going to be, would be a really, I know some of you may have seen this before, but there's a, there's a number of pictures from this, uh, from this afternoon that I wanted to include, but we couldn't track down the, the photographer. And um, the publishers, unfortunately, because we couldn't track down the photographer, weren't, weren't happy to put it in the book. So you're seeing it here today if you haven't seen it before. But I think that this is the last ever picture of the original lineup before uh, before unfortunately they, they split up see that all right um, so this is the before and after so um, as I said it was a bit of a surprise um, 
just, I mean, the publishers were whinging a bit about how many pages there were on it, but when I actually saw the final version, I could understand why, because I don't think they can literally get any more, any more pages in it. But that's the sort of before and after of the, of the original book. So there's, there are some questions about what's different in the new book to the old one. Um, quite a lot um, <laughs> is, the, is the sort of short answer. Um, more, there's more depth. Uh, but I've, I've basically re rewritten it effectively. There's a few passages you might remember if you, if you bought the original one. Um, this was a really proud moment for me. Rocket, this was the first um, review that came through and um, the publisher sort of, sort of sent it casually. Oh, we just had this review come through from, uh, this was from Shindig magazine. And I, I was at work when I kind of got this and I kind of sort of thought, oh, it can't be very good because I just kind of almost tossed it off. And then I read this, and I, you can't read it at the back, but it kind of says here, it's a classic, pure and simple, against which all other BAM bios should be measured. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, almost, I almost fell over. I mean, it's just like, you know, someone who doesn't write professionally. And also, my worry was it's so big, are people going to, just going to be bored of it? I mean, there's, there's the sort of the golden years, but do people want to hear the whole story? And so far, so good on the, on the feedback, which was really good to see. More, probably more importantly was, um, was the response from, from Kevin. <laughs> so, hello. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Come in. So this is, so Kevin, Kevin lives in Ireland. He got his copy yesterday. And um, he dropped me a note. He's, he's obviously in nocturnal. Hello. Hello, sorry. How are you doing? No worries. This came through at 2.48 2 in the morning on Friday morning. So I kind of woke up to sort of reading this on the, on the Friday. But, you know, thank you. The book arrived today. It's a beauty, classy piece of work all round. It does, does us more than justice. You know, for Kevin Godley to say this book does us more than justice is just such a fantastic um, accolade um, for me. Congratulations on a stunning job. And literally I said to him, we've got the launch coming up. Uh, tomorrow, it would be great if you could send some pictures. And as I said, within a couple of hours, he sent through. through. Unfortunately, people have started to post them already. I was going to try and save it, the content for today, but there's three, uh, the three pictures that, that he kind of sent. And he's posted this on Instagram, I think, as well today, just with a, with a nice kind of comment um, around it. So that's a little bit of a, a sort of a potted history. How is everyone doing on the temperature front? Is it OK? Or shall we open the doors? OK? OK. <laughs> We've literally gone back to 76, it's the heat. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Peter's going to host now the, uh, the Q&A session. Well, I'm going to try. We have had some questions sent to us online, but I kind of prefer to kind of have questions in the room. So by raising your hands and not shouting out... Oh, I've got one already. Um, you can't so ask a question if you raise question your hands. Question and a point. Oh. Yep. How come there's no pictures throughout the book rather than just open those two separate chapters? Is it costly? Yeah, I mean, originally what I wanted to do was an, a completely illustrated yeah. version of the book. That's where, it's, that's where it started out in my mind. But the, because the, the, the word count, I think it's 170,000 words, doing that with it fully illustrated just wasn't feasible. A, from a cost, but just from a size, from a size point of view. But that was what I, that's what I really originally wanted to do. And the, um, the publishers, Rocket 88, um, did a really fantastic book a few years ago on, on the band Talk Talk, if there's any Talk Talk fans in the, in the audience. And um, when I saw that book, that's what made me approach them originally to say, look, that's what I would want. But it was, it, unfortunately, I got carried away with the words and it, that's what happened. So we tried to put as many pictures in as we could. I think we've got 32 pages of pictures in there. Um, but I would have liked to have done it as an illustration. Yeah. Maybe, maybe next time. The point I want to make, it's, it's a comparison. I've got the biography of Gentle Giant. Yeah. And uh, to put it into words, I'm not certainly virtual and readable. Okay. In, in essence, you can imagine the sentence is about 50, 100 words. Let's say the sentence is in the It's just completely to one book, but compared to this. And that's the worst book I've ever read in my life. In oh, fact, right. I don't even finish reading it. I've had it about 15 years. Okay. <laughs> the worst book in the world. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Literally. But this one, I've, I've got to about chapter four so far. And it's. Right. Oh, good. Thank you. It's good to get the feedback. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, hi, um, hi, I'm very proud of the first book, and um, I haven't got around to reading the new one, but yeah. looking forward to it. I'm really intrigued to know whether you got any more uh, uh, insight into the infamous Manchester meeting in October when it was in 76 when they split up, because Eric's version of events yeah. was that he was basically told by the other three that they were going to go without him. And I always found that implausible that you know, Rob and Kevin would 
want to go with, with Graham yeah. as well. I just wonder whether you've got any more. Um, what, what I did in the end in, in this book is that I, I kept the original things Eric told me when we met up originally, which were broadly the same as that. You know, there was a, a meeting and um, there was a feeling that he was, that they were saying he's become too domineering in the studio. I think the Eric one feels like it's, it's pushing some of that a little bit further. So I kind of didn't go as far as to sort of do that. But when I talked to um, Graham and, and Kevin about it and said, does that ring true? There was a kind of grunt, but not really a, a denial or a positive thing. So I think there was something in that that, that happened. Whether, whether it was ever seriously a, an option to do consequences as a, as a sort of a three-man three 10cc project, when I have read things and heard things about that, or whether it was always a bit of a, a sham, I don't know. So um, I, I've kept with what I think from listening to the different protagonists, what I think happened around that around that time. Um, that's all I can say. No, because that's the pivotal part of the story. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. meeting or meetings they had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems you know, Kevin's all on their path, weren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they were going to. I think they were going to leave regardless, weren't they? Around that kind of time, pretty much. But um, whether whether that was an easier way to, to leave, I don't know. But but yeah, I've I've kind of from all the what I've heard, kept it in the new book as I kind of, I think it's probably the most plausible story. One thing you find from the strawberry research is that people's views change as hindsight sets in. So things that they perhaps, perhaps didn't happen in their mind become more prominent as years go on. I found that quite a lot with strawberry stuff, that stories kind of evolve and people's memories of stories change. So, uh, but an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to just uh, to the start. If there's any truth in what I've heard to be said that uh, Bohemian Rhapsody was influenced at all by the brilliant one of the um, If you ask Graham Goldman, he'll say yes. Um, if you ask Roger Taylor from Queen, he'll say no. Um, you know, I think there's, there's unmistakably some, I think, some 10cc influences, not just One Night in Paris. I think mm -hmm. even things like Fresh Air for My Mama. You know, if you listen to that, there's some, I think, some pieces of that that arguably could have fed into Bohemian Rhapsody. But at the moment, it's a point of view. The, they, the, the, there's a architect, there's a, a critic called Paul Lester, who's a big 10cc fan, and uh, he actually posed that question to Roger Taylor and said, "Is there any truth in it?" And uh, the answer from him was no. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, quick question. Yeah. Any ideas why Lord Cream didn't get involved in it? Um, I, I, I don't know. And the difficult thing is I've got some theories, but I'm putting words in his mouth. I mean, first time round, I think he was in um, Los Angeles at the time. So I think he was just probably just not in, out of it yeah. and not that interested. I tried a couple of different routes to get him involved this time. Um, I tried through Eric to get him involved, obviously, because they're brothers-in-law, yeah. and that, that didn't work out. I then, it turns out, I used to work with someone who was Lord Cream's niece. So I even unashamedly tried the family connection and said, would you mind asking him? And um, all I got back was, um, yeah, it just wasn't up for doing interviews. You know, why that is, whether just other things going on, whether he doesn't want to talk about 10cc. Um, it would be wrong for me to, to, to hypothesize, because otherwise I'm putting words in his mouth. I know he's still playing. So yes. Someone who saw him. Yeah. Last year. Yeah, I mean that's 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 right, and I think on the Trevor Horn band they do yeah, they do two or three uh, ten cc songs as part of that uh, that group. But um, what I did try to do was make sure that Lol's voice was um, featured in the book. So that's it's more from the archive side of things. But I think well, hopefully when you read it, you do you know feel that Lol is there. But it is a shame. It would have been fantastic to have got them got them all involved. But that's that's all I know. Next time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't say that, my wife is roommate, she's over there. <laughs> Did Eric's book ever get published? Only as an e-book. I think Kevin and um, Eric, have only, they're, only, they're only available, I think, as an Apple e-book. Um, I don't know whether there's any intention to try. I mean, the thing is, they're crammed full of content, aren't they? So, in a sense, it's quite hard to do that as a paperback because you've got lots of you know, input to different, you know, to songs and videos and things. But I know I see a lot of comments about people would like to have a physical copy of it, but uh, it, it was only e-book. And can I ask, I've not opened my copy yet, you're having a life in this thing, so it may be covered in there, but is there anything left in the vaults that's not been placed? 
I think there probably is. Um, some people in the room probably know more about that than, than I do, because I mean, I think um, the strawberry vaults and what was in there. So I, I think there, there, I'm sure there is. I mean, even on, if for those people that um, there was a fantastic program about 10 years ago, the record producers, did everyone hear that? Um, the BBC Radio 2 program. Eric actually gave even the master tapes of the famous songs to Steve Levine, who's the producer. And they and it was the first time they dissected it, and they f and they found all this all lots of stuff on there. The original middle eight to I'm Not in Love was still intact. There were some of the um, attempts to record Donna and uh, and the things that didn't quite go awry. But I think yes, I mean I probably there are people in the room that probably could answer that more the, more effectively than me. But my sense is yes, there is. Um, there's stuff I've never heard. The Rev the Revlon 1975 uh, 1976 ad that the original guys made. It was a radio ad that they did in July '76. One of the last things they ever recorded. Um, if anyone's got anyone in the room got that that one, I can't I've track that one tape. down. So you got it? I've got the master tape. The box. <laughs> <laughs> but not uh, the no. I've got I don't the tape know whether too. Peter, you've got a point of view on that in terms of the. Um, yeah, I remember uh, one thing distinctly. Remember, there's been several in fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was there when you were there. You were there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. The uh, so I'm right to say that. They, were, they wouldn't do anything like doing it and it wasn't classy, it was below it. And they, that people would say they wouldn't do it's the advert. So I remember sort of talking about I've joked, joked, they said, oh, I wish I'd recorded Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheese. And you must be joking. I said, well, the money's made. It didn't mean anything. They did the advert. And what happened when they came back from the advert? Do you remember them? How many sports cars were at waiting for us at the airport? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All of a sudden we realised, hang on a minute, it's not too bad. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Quite yeah. happy about that. Any other questions? It's not so much a question. First of all, Liam, uh, I really enjoyed the original version. I, re I remember writing to you and sending you some money, and you sent him. I, I actually sent you a little book in exchange. I can't. I think it was a No, it's all right. It was, it was a gift. Uh, I think it was a Morris's Manchester or yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. But so I'm looking forward to reading this. But just a, a very quick sort of anecdote. Um, at the end of last year, I got news that a very old friend of mine had died, a guy called Steve, and um, when he was 18, he was looking to buy his first car, and he saw this advert in Manchester Evening News for a Ford Capri. So he had a, uh, a Stockport number, he rang it, and the guy said, yeah, come round and have a look at it. So him and his dad went to this address in Bramall, and there was this Capri parked in the drive. The door opened, and it was Eric. <laughs> so, um, of course, his dad didn't know who he was, but this is Steve. New, and, oh right, it, uh, you know. Um, so they had a look at it, and they said, "Yeah, we'll we'll buy it. We'll come back in a couple of days' time, and we'll we'll bring the money." So Eric said, "Fine." So he came back a couple of days later to collect the car, and Lol was there as well. So he came back to me. So you won't believe this. I've just got my new car, and not only have I met, bought it off Eric. Lol was there as well, and I thought, "Wow, oh, that's fantastic." Yeah. 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 You can't sort of imagine today. <laughs> Going to buy a second-hand car off somebody. It's, it's, it's a bloke who's just had a number one uh, hit single, is it, really? It's, quite it's funny, in Eric's book, you know, you get, it's like Things I Do For Love, and it's got a section on cars, isn't it? It's funny, he doesn't mention the Capri in there. No, he doesn't, no. <laughs> I'm sure there must be plenty. I've got some online ones, if not uh, one. So that's a question. It's just a request from uh, Eric's got uh, a lot of fans in the US. And this is from, uh, from in the US, and yeah. uh, they just say that they'd love uh, a note to his fans from him if possible okay. to let them know how he is and how he's doing. Yeah, yeah. And I think okay. he said, Yeah, uh, you, you know, he's doing quite well. Yeah, they'd love to hear from him. Okay. He's, uh, he's got a lot of fans over there. You don't hear from him very often. No, no, no. Well, I'll, I'll pass that on to uh, Jilly for you. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. 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 We did have an online question which will probably produce a kind of load of groans in the room um, but we said we'd answer it and that is how did 10cc get their name so I said it would but uh, Liam I'm gonna let you explain it's just in case you don't know I'm gonna let Liam explain yeah I mean I think it's one of these things that um, everybody has got their own point of view on it and maybe the truth will never quite be uh, uncovered but this was one of the interesting things when I spoke to Jonathan King to actually say to him that what well, what is the actual story with it and all I can tell you is what I think the actual story is and then we, we can bash it. It's not necessarily a good story because the better story is the one that we're all laughing about but um, you know the story that he tells is that um, when he heard um, Donna and said look you know I want to release this on my label 
um, they said to him that we haven't got a name and that night with the, with the song playing in his head he went to sleep and he and he, what in his in his dream he saw if you, you can imagine when you're looking down the charts the chart rundown and you kind of he saw this band that was <coughs> number one in the singles chart in America and the, Amer the album chart called 10cc and the reason why he liked that name was when you're looking down a chart rundown it's quite an unusual to have a name that's kind of got a combination of numbers and letters and everything else um, didn't mean anything it was just that was just a, a good combination of things it wasn't any, anything more than that and he phoned them the next day to say um, you've got your name and they said well great that'll better be us spent then if that's the kind of the, the story behind it now you hear lots of em embellished there's obviously the famous story we'll talk about maybe in a second but you know I, you hear Eric and Graham talk about a dream with a big sign out of Wembley Stadium saying best band in the world and all those kind of things I think that's purely an embellishment of, of that I don't think there was any dream around that whether there was another kind of dream that inspired Jonathan King in the first place <laughs> to come up with 10 CC I don't know I didn't get the sense from him that um, that, that, that that was the inspiration and, and he was pretty frank with lots of things I'm, I'm, I don't know why he wouldn't tell me if that wasn't the case so I think the story is he, he had the dream and he saw the the combination of numbers and letters and that's why he went with it. Okay. I remember when I was 13 they were on a Radio 1 thing called Sounds on Sunday and they passed it off, oh it's a very small motorbike. Yeah, yeah. I was only 13 and I thought that was the race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm sure there must be lots. Come on, don't be shy. What, I, are, go on. what are they all doing now? Um, so Graham's about to release a new album uh, called Mod Modesty Forbids. So he's touring, you know, he's, he's continuing to tour as, you know, the 10cc, the Graham Gorman's 10cc, if you like. So yeah. he's, in, he's in Australia at the moment touring uh, with, <coughs> with, the, with them. And he's touring in the in the uh, in the spring, but he's got an album coming out called Modesty for Bits. Uh, there's a very good um, podcast called the Strange Brew Podcast, if you haven't heard it. And he was a recent guest on there, and they play a few tracks from that album. Um, and actually, the three or four tracks they played sound really good. So he's still active, still writing, still recording, and performing probably more gigs each year probably than he's ever done um, so he's very active within that um, Eric's retired I think officially re you know retired from from music I think most of the the last 10 15 years he's been more interested in he buys houses with his wife and does them up and then sells them off so, they've, so he's interested in non-musical pursuits um, but the last album he had was um, in 2009 so he's not really done any any music since then Lol Cream is it's kind of best pals with Trevor Horn so um, they formed a, a band together, called, originally called The Producers, now the Trevor Horn Band, um, which plays gigs every now and again. There's, there's a picture in the book of him at the, I think, one of the festivals last summer. Yeah. Um, and they play three 10cc songs during their set. They do uh, Dean and I, Rubber Bullets and I'm Not In Love. So there's a bit of a, a flame still there. Um, and because he's a mate of Trevor Horn, if you look at a lot of the albums that Trevor Horn produced, you'll see him on the credits, you know, he plays guitar on this or sings on that and occasionally writes a song to this. So he's really, I guess with Trevor Horn is his main yeah. sort of partnership. And um, Kevin is recording a solo album called Muscle Memory that's um, hopefully due quite soon. He's about to hopefully direct his first film called The Gate, which is based on um, Orson Welles when he first went to Dublin. Um, so it's, it's awesome. Wells looking back on his life and his first experience of getting his first job in, in Dublin called The Gate. Um, but he's got fingers in all sorts of pies. He's kind of got so active in, um, he's just got in, involved in a gaming company as well. He's still directing videos. He's done some stuff recently for, for Keen, um, for Elbow. So he's still active in that kind of world. So they're all, you know, they're all happily pursuing their own kind of paths. Yeah, I think it's still it's still the title. I managed to get from him the um, provisional track listing of it, and that's included in the back of the book. Um, I don't know when it's coming. He's got a new record company that's going to be releasing it. Um, but yes, he's still still intending. I think there's eleven tracks on it. Still intending it for release. Mm -hmm. Any possibility of any live recordings of the original band? I know there's a King Biscuit one that exists. Yeah, yeah. Which was butchered when it was released because it 
the full the full version is on there's a website in the US called Wolfgangs and there's a, and the full one hour 45 performance is on there and it, and that's brilliant it's really uh, fantastic to hear the unadulterated version of that yeah. gig and it's really well recorded I mean there are there are I mean I don't know probably um, Zeb and uh, Peter might be able to answer this, but things like Nebworth presumably were, were recorded, were they at the time? If we can mention the mention the K word. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, well, Zeb, were you with Martin at the you were back? I was out in the storm, the mobile van. Where we were you? in the mobile van, yeah. Where were you? Were you with Martin? I was with the monitors on stage. Yeah, with the monitors. Martin was at the back. Mark Martin was front of the house. And the storm's in there, great. They decided to switch. They didn't want them to use that desk. Switched to another desk, didn't they? That's no, what you do it. No, no. What happened was you wanted all the channels coming down different lines that's in the correct. mobile van. Yeah, that's right. So there was a huge cross patch. Yeah. So like when you put Eric's vocal up, you've got a bass drum and things like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the first five minutes of that show was an absolute nightmare. So yeah. Martin found out where everything was coming from. That's right, it was awful. Now, I, mean, I think we got something down because we've got a multi-track state, but I can't remember it ever being I think we started off by playing an instrumental. Yeah, and I can't really remember if we ever mixed it properly in the end. So, a bit, bit, oh, bit weird, that, to say the least, that day. Yeah, Stone's always blamed to NCC for the late yeah. the extra hour or something. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, you were there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, well, they're like, when the audience tends to We're all very tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. it's about one more o'clock in the morning before we all have a seat back in the first Stone's face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's very footage. There's two, there, there is, there's a half of I'm Not In Love. And there's the full version of Rubber Bullets, that's on film. Oh, um, I, I, I mean, the scale of Yeah, I, I get the sense, I don't know whether you guys might know this, I mean, whether there's footage of the whole film, or whether they were just getting the cameras lined up for when the Stones came on, I don't know. But there's certainly half of the um, of I'm Not In Love, which was the last song they played, and then all of Rubber Bullets, which was the, which was the encore. So that definitely does exist. I know there's an official release of bits and pieces from it. Yeah, it was a bit cheeky though. I mean, it was it was like it was on the. For example, the ten cc bit was this that was badly recorded bootleg, mm. like almost like side of stage. Yeah. So it was it was dressed up to be something bigger than it was. I think. Mm. Um, it didn't I've got really... one from Liverpool in seventy six. Yes. Which was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a few good demo. Right. Recorded. It was a bootleg recording then, was yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in the in the back of the book, I've just put an asterisk by all the gigs that I, I've heard that there is a bootleg. So there may be other ones out there, but if you look in the back of the book, it kind of goes there. Right, there is a bootleg recording that exists, or there's some video recording that exists when it when it does. It's a really simple question. It's three, but is there really simple? Yeah. What's your favourite Ten CC song? What's your favourite Godwin Creamer song? And who's your favourite Ten CC member? Oh. <laughs> Um, my favourite, my favourite Ten CC song is "I'm Not in Love." So I'll tell you some others because, but I, I still think there's something about that record which, um, even now, I hear it and it kind of sends shivers down my spine in terms of that. I think there's just been nothing like it. The sentiment behind it, the way Eric sings it, the, back, the backing vocal, is amazing. But the the other songs I would pick out if I was doing my kind of top five would be. Um, Somewhere in Hollywood and Old Wild Men from Sheet Music would be a big favourite of mine. Um, I'm Mandy Fly Me is a big favourite of mine from How Dare You. Don't Hang Up would be a favourite from. So they, they would be the sort of the four or five I would pick out. Um, favourite Godly and Cream song, um, I would say probably something like either Under Your Thumb or Cry, something like that, I think, um, would be probably one of those. I, I've always had a soft spot for Eric, I have to say, from a from a fan's point of view. When I kind of grew up, you know, I kind of, I'd say my favourite. I think I think the beauty of Ten CC was it couldn't have worked without each of them. But I think when I when I think back to the records that I love, um, Eric's voice is a big part of it. His songwriting is a big part of it. His guitar playing is a big part of it. Um, so I would probably say that. The Golden Cream at the tour. No. I think there's a great quote in the book, I think Laurel Cream was asked, when they started to be successful again with Under Your Thumb, I think they were asked 
um, are you going to tour? And, it, and his quote was, I'd rather face a firing squad. <laughs> yeah. So um, he did play one gig, they did, I think they did one gig playing um, with Phil Manzanera as part of their 801. Oh yeah, I've got that. Um, so they, they guested on that. And, was that? I don't know whether they did both of them, the Manchester one, mm. they, they certainly did. And they, apparently they, they, they did sing backing vocals at a Sting gig in 1985. Yeah. Um, in Paris because they got asked to play at Live Aid at that time by Bob Geldof. Apparently Bob Geldof was walking across the road and they gave him a lift and, and he was just setting up Live Aid. But um, yeah, I think I think they don't want to, they, they weren't fussed about touring enough, based on that quote. You can carry it on tour with it, you know. I, don't, I doubt it, I doubt it. Liam, do you think Graham's justified in still using the 10cc name? <laughs> um. I, the, way, the way I kind of talk about it in the book is that um, I think it's a subject that divides the fans in the way that it did when Godley and Cream left because there was a school of thought that said how can Eric and Graham carry on with 10cc with uh, half the band gone. Um, I think originally when it was Graham Goldman's 10cc or it was 10, Graham Gould, 10cc and Friends, I think personally that, that's a more accurate description. I did not go along to the first few tours that they did. I have to say, I've been since many times, and I think as a group of musicians, they do they do a great justice to the the songs. I mean, the musicianship is fantastic, and I do think Graham. Um, every gig that I've been to, every single song, he kind of introduces the song by saying who wrote it and what's the story behind it. So, for me, he acknowledges the contribution that the, all the guys have made. Um, but I think over time. You know, calling it Graham Gorman's 10cc, just to calling it 10cc, I think that, that's just something that's eroded. So I, I, I think it's doing the legacy of the band good, ultimately. That's what I think is, is keeping the music of 10cc alive. And occasionally Kevin will pop up at a show, and that's great to see when that occasionally happens. But I know it's a subject that, divide, that divides fans. Slade went the same way. Slade, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Band like that because you know it's not a jigsaw, it's people's feelings and lives. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So, what, so, where do you stand on it? Where you are? Oh, well, well, I'm happy to go and see yeah. Graham, yeah. Um, just because I, I love it. Yeah. And he can call it, he can call it what you want, he can call yeah. it 2.5 cc if you want to. I've got four purchases with him, how long is he doing? Exactly, yeah, yeah. And there's some great bits, I think, you know, for anyone that's seen them when they do Donna, for example, um, you know, replacing the normal telephone ring in Donna with the sort of the mobile phone that they kind of do. There's some really nice little 10cc touches I think that kind of go through it. So I, I agree with you. I'll do that. Right. All right. Yeah. 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 yeah I think, so I think it's doing the legacy good because people want to hear the songs and the, um, they do, do great credit I think to the songs when they play them live. Um, after the initial split uh, I went out and bought the consequences out from here, straight down the top and uh, spent quite a few hours listening to it and you know it was an impressive piece of work uh, what did you think of it at the time well i've got to be careful because sean who's photographing this is the man behind the consequences podcast for those that don't know in the room well worth i think 35 episodes so far and still counting something like that yeah, and the secret ones, of uh, the secret <laughs> ones. Um, um, uh, consequences i mean i i still i mean when it when the cd reissue came out last year i kind of got it listen to it again I mean I think there's some great stuff on there there's also the, the, the challenge I've got I guess with 10cc when they split is Eric and Graham at their worst when, the, when they, they lost a bit of the edge becomes a little bit saccharin on one end of uh, one section and Godly and Cream I think uh, sometimes disappear up their ingenuity should we say <laughs> so um, I, I think there's some great moments on there but I think what it missed was a bit of you know someone who was helping them cajole it and edit it into something that's a bit more cohesive um, because in places it kind of lost me in other places it sounds amazing um, I think the first side of it which is probably close to the spirit of what they were trying to do with the gizmo is fantastic um, but obviously then it becomes morphed into a play and other, other things but it's definitely got some great moments I love it obviously but uh, it just brought back a lot of memories you know yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like, and it, uh, my when, I, when the book came out, you know, and I ordered it and everything, uh, for weeks up to late, even to this, so I've listened to the back catalogue and just you forget what a great band they were, you know, and the diversity of the tracks that uh, yeah. 
Beatles of the North, you know, mm -hmm. North, of the North West, like. <laughs> Manchester. Manchester, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I've spoken enough, quite frankly, yeah. But, yeah cheers. If I could give a little plug, if you haven't been already to the level one where the strawberry gallery is, you can see an original gizmo sitting in a the case there, um, lent, well, given to the museum by the company who are now manufacturing them again. So if you are guitar players, you can get a gizmo now. It's only a couple of hundred dollars and you can have a nice piece of Stockport and strawberry history on your guitar. So, but go and look in the case if you haven't already seen it because the original 70s gizmo is in there as well. Yeah, new one work as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter's asking what's the only hit record that a gizmo appeared on. I know, yeah, I know. I think I think there was more than one. No. He's on that. Hit Blue single. Liverpool, Liverpool Lou, Lou, the Lou by the Scaffold, yeah. And um, Gemini Dream by the Moody Blues is on as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, Pete, he's on. Peter does tell a good story about when Liverpool Lou was on top of the pops and they get to the gizmo bits and here's the potential for millions of people seeing a gizmo live on top of the pops. Yeah. And what did they do? John Gorman, no, John Gorman had a box on, with it, the handle on it, and he was putting the handle, and the gizmo was played, and at the end of the solo, a flat knocked out, and an egg rolled out. Heaven and law went banana synthesis, do you remember that? Yeah. They went, through the trouble. <laughs> 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 Okay, so any other questions before we move to Liam signing some books? Because the museum closes at five, so uh, go on, we've got a question there. Apart from probably being <coughs> the only Danish guy who wore out the, my local library's version of Consequences, actually. Yeah. Uh, young me. Uh, I, as I was spectacularly late, I haven't had a chance to look at the book, so it might all be in there, yeah. but if you were to sort of uh, want to find a bit more information on the technical sides of Strawberry North as well as South, yeah. where would you go? You give this guy a call. <laughs> or you speak to Peter and Zeb, who probably know <laughs> yeah. more about recording in Strawberry than I do. Is there anything written? No. You well, your dissertation. Well, uh, that's your dissertation, no? Would not really? Yeah, well, I did a PhD on strawberry back in 20 odd years, no, 10 years ago. But there's less technical in there. But for example, um, do you mind if I no, show? No, go for it, yeah, yeah. So Chris Hewitt, who has his own private collection of recording studio equipment, has written a book about Martin Hammett's recording in strawberry, which has a lot of technical um, knowledge in there. So that's on sale upstairs in the museum reception. So. Uh, Martin Hannett and his equipment and Strawberry Studios is one book, but um, the technical side of Strawberry is probably something that you could write several books on, I would have thought. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, well, yeah, well, uh, I think you have to have that technical know-how somehow and then make it kind of uh, accessible to make people without, yeah, all right, make it interesting. But uh, yeah, good point, good question. Yeah. I've got one. Yeah? Can I ask you what, uh, how did you come up with the title? I mean, I love that song. Yeah. Well, it was, it was because, it, because um, so many people think 10CC are the worst band in the world. <laughs> you know, and that was, that was partly my experience of growing up in the 80s, where you talk about 10CC and people would, like, look blankly at you or sneer at you or whatever it was. So it was, it was a play on that, that um, actually here's this band that is their, <coughs> their own song, but there's this kind of two sides of the story. That was it. I know that it's interesting online when they, when in the run-up to the publication of the book, not not all 10CC fans know that song, mm -hmm. so you were getting quite. No, I wouldn't quite say it's hate mail because that's probably a bit, <laughs> a bit of a stretch, but they thought I was dissing the band mm -hmm. by calling it the worst yeah. band in the world, and then there was had to be reminded actually it's a play on play on words, but it was because of that because they don't. I think they don't get the credit they they deserve. Can I just say I do beg to differ in all friendliness, where, um, because um, when I used to tell people. That they that I was a big TTC fan, they 
look quizzically at me, then I told them all about bus stop and for your love yeah, yeah. and yeah. the backstory. Oh yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. And to me also, they may be on unique here, but they sat very comfortably uh, next part with me. Mm. It was all music that I loved and mm. just taking everything in. Yeah. And um, so when Graham produced the Ramones, it was yeah. perfectly natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. What, what happened to all the equipment that was in uh, Strobe Studios when it was all dismantled, the desks and everything? <coughs> the, two, the two main desks, sorry Liam, I'm pinching no, your... Go for it, go for um, it. So the red, lovely red Helios desk and the Formula Sound desk and that are both in Canada. So they're both working in Canada for various reasons. One's in a museum, a working museum and one's owned by a musician in Canada, so the desks are there and still working. Yeah, it's a famous Canadian one whose name I can't remember. Uh, Mahogany Rush is the band. That's the one, yeah. So yeah, he owns the Formula Sound desk, so. Uh. Anyway, before we get lost in strawberry talk, because I could do that all day, um, we obviously need Liam to sign some copies of his book. He's just doing a quick bootleg one in the corner there. We're going to have to do a bit of room rearranging.